I try to show you what we are doing in the in the in my group and how to link what we could do in a joint program with the Scottish research groups. And because, uh, you know, hydrogen has become one of the most important topics in Europe nowadays, I linked uh, our work in photovoltaics with the green hydrogen um, projects, which are now uh, being discussed in the European Union and hopefully will be plenty of money to do basic research science in the next uh, European framework, the Horizon Europe. So basically, uh, this is the group, the group at the ICIQ's institution, which is about 300 persons and about 16 groups. Uh, we don't have permanent positions, uh, not even the professors have a permanent position, they have evaluations every five years. So that's why everybody looks so young and very happy because uh, they, they have to come here to the PhD and postdocs and then they leave. And basically, uh, all our research is carried on by very young people. So, so so this is basically funded by the national government, Spanish government, Generalitat of Catalonia, which is regional funding, ICREA, which is a body that supports excellence and pay for, the, for my salary as a professor, and the ICIQ. And we also get a lot of funding from the European projects. So I focus on chemistry. So we are Institute of Chemistry and we develop uh, molecules and materials. And uh, today I would like to talk you about uh, the well-known uh, perovskite solar cell, which has been a very hot topic in the last years because they are closing the gap between molecular and silicon solar cells. So if you are aware of this technology, uh, you will have heard about it. It's been uh, everybody who has been working on perovskite solar cells in the beginning has reached the highest edge factors ever. And they have a lot of citations. And, and those of you who do not know about perovskite solar cells, perovskite uh, solar cells are based on a hybrid material composed by a lead iodide and usually a cation. It usually is methyl ammonium or similar. And they are perovskite because the structure, the ketonine structure is actually a, a perovskite. This has been a very nice discovery because it's solution process, but then it solidifies and becomes a semiconductor. And the efficiencies nowadays are as high as silicon. So the last report, I think, in science was about 25% lab scale, OK? So but in our group, we're trying to replace uh, one of the, the materials which are used in perovskite solar cells that makes the device to be unstable, which is the uh, spire omtat, which is an organic semiconductor. Everything which has to do with organic semiconductors, either polymers or small molecules, uh, with time and water, they become oxidized, and that compromises the stability of the solar cells. So we use SAMS because uh, there's a lot of literature on, on, on self assembly layers, and they are easy to sensitize. So you can go in toning scale if you want. And the idea to use SAMS is that they make a very good selective contact for devices. And I will, I will show you some, some examples, not only for, for solar cells. Basically, you need a, a substrate, which usually is FTO or ITO. So it's fluorine doped in tin oxide or indium tin oxide. And then you have a spacer, which usually is an alkane chain. And then you have functional groups. And if you are clever enough, you can design these functional groups to be able to change, for example, the work function of the substrate or to uh, have a supermolecular interaction with the perovskite material and so on. So we always thought that this was a good approach. So basically, uh, this is the molecules we, we, we develop. So you, you have here the carboxylic group, which is similar to what Neil has shown you. So these anchors covalently to the metal oxide, as I said, uh, FTO or ITO. You have this alkane, or in this case, you have these two uh, benzene rings, and then you have a triferinamine group here with uh, methoxy groups. Uh, basically, this molecule is well known in all the industry because it can conduct uh, electronic holes very well with high uh, mobility. So what we do basically is uh, to make devices. This is a, a typical device of a perovskite solar cells. This is an organic solar cell, uh, which are made of a blend of uh, organic semiconductor like fullerene and another organic semiconductor like, for example, uh, the ketopiropiro. And you can get about 14%, which is quite good. Actually, this efficiency now has got high up, up to 19%. So organic solar cells are again on the track for very high efficient solar cells. And they have many advantages, but I will not discuss this today. And then perovskite solar cells, as you can see here, they have a huge current. So we're talking about uh, 20, uh, 20 milliamps. These are very small cells. 
And uh, the important thing is they have a very high voltage. We are talking about uh, over one volt. And this is one of the main drawbacks of organics. So the main drawback of organics is that you can get higher currents because you can design polymers or small molecules to be panchromatic. You can also tune the mix of the organic molecules to have a very high field factor, which is the how square is this curve. The, the more square it is, the higher the field factor. And because efficiency is the is to multiply current by field factor by voltage, then uh, you want this to be as high as possible. So the main drawback of the carrier losses, it's mainly the organic. So here we lose about 200 millivolts respect to the perovskite. And this is one of the tricks on the perovskite. So you can tune the perovskite to either go down in current and get higher voltage, uh, or you can tune the perovskite to go high in voltage and, and lower in current. Of course, you want to have a, a compromise, which to push as much as possible the current and to push as much as possible the voltage. So, and then you can reach this 25%, which is currently the record. Uh, how it looks like uh, in, in the device? Well, this is the FTO, the fluorine doped tin oxide. Then you need a dense layer of titanium dioxide. You still need a, a thinner uh, mesoporous titanium dioxide layer. This resembles to to disensitize solar cells. Then you have the methyl ammonium lead iodide. This is the high, the, the, what is called the, the perovskite. You need the whole transport material, which usually people use the spire on that. This is the molecule that people use as a standard. And then you use a, a metal contact. So basically here, the selective contacts are the spire on that here and the titanium dioxide. So this will be the selective contacts for electrons, so n-type. And this will be the selective contact for holes, the p-type. So we, we talk here about the NIP uh, solar cell. This is the, what is called the normal perovskite solar structure. You also can uh, reverse this and then put here the p-type and here the n-type, and then you have what is called the inverse perovskite solar cell structure. So basically, this is a classic energetic diagram. So don't take the, the numbers as uh, absolute numbers. This is taken from the bibliography. And this is one of the main challenges of the research nowadays is like to tune these energy levels, right? So we don't have much losses in uh, here. And, and for that, we need advanced techniques like UPS or, or similar like SPS and so on. So here is two different molecules, one that has two ferina amine groups and one that uh, is our champion that has this structure. And we do here uh, use them in, in, in this uh, inverted perovskite solar cells. So as I said, we don't use the titanium, we use the SAMs. We have the methyl ammonium lead iodide, and then we use as a selective contact for electrons, the PCBM, which is a derivative of uh, C60, and then we use silver. Uh, the, the way we do that is very simple. So this is a, a, a requisite because you want to do this as close as possible to facilitate life to industry. So you get ITO, you dip the ITO in a solution at 45 degrees. So this is mild temperatures, industry can afford it. Four hours, you rinse, you have your surface in the monolayer. You then construct or build the perovskite layer on top. You evaporate the C60 and then you put the metal contact and here we are, we have the solar cells ready to get measured. And with that, we have efficiencies which are about uh, nowadays close to 21%. This was the first result published in, in 2019. We now have uh, go as high as 21%. And this is how the IV curves look like. So we have the high voltage, we have the high current, the EQE spectrum that matches the current we, we get. and the stability uh, of, of the efficiency over a period of uh, two minutes or three minutes, which is what we need to measure uh, spectroscopy. Of course, uh, those who knows about perovskite solar cells, you will hear about the hysteresis process. This hysteresis process is due to the fact that these semiconductors are ionic. Actually, it's the first ionic semiconductor material that has been useful for solar cells. And there is a big difference between the forward measurements and the reverse measurements of the IV curve. When you use the SAMS monolayers, you don't see this hysteresis. This is key if you want to make modules and because modules are made of individual cells. And imagine that you have solar cells with hysteresis, your module will be uh, very bad. 
So SAMS helps you to uh, reduce the hysteresis quite a lot. In fact, I would call this hysteresis free. And you can see uh, efficiencies are well above the 15%, which is the value that we compare with organics. This is uh, 20 days under illumination, almost no degradation at all. Of course, this is not a test that silicon has to pass. So we are talking here about uh, cycling between 80 degrees and minus four. We are not talking here about 1,000 hours illumination. We don't do this at the lab. We basically take the cell and measure during 20 days. But you know, you see the cell uh, at the lab scale is quite robust. There are publications of people who do really measure stability that shows that these cells can be st as stable as uh, silicon, which means this is more than 1,000 hours at one sun, even 85 uh, degrees of temperature. So you want to know more about this, you can check bibliography by the group of um, Henry Snaith or a group of Ted Sargent or Antonio Abate. They are the three main uh, leaders in terms of the stability of these solar cells. Why perovskite solar cells? Well, as Organic solar cells, they hold the promise to be able to be applied on, on electric cars to help uh, to implement the, the energy of the electric cars. They also are flexible. You also can uh, implement them in textile. And of course, this is a nice idea about how to power, for example, bus stations or uh, stations where you have to refuel your, your car with electrical power. And I think that in the future, uh, sooner than later, because the electric car is also a reality and has to be implemented in Europe, according to the news we have here, uh, we will see a lot of this station either uh, solar coupled to hydrolyzers or wind energy coupled to hydrolyzers. So this is coming and will happen before the 2050. So here is one example that we will have done, uh, coupling solar PV to hydrogen evolution. So the, we, this is our classic solar cell. What we do is uh, we couple these two together with, uh, to make a tandem. It's called four terminal tandem. So you get two cells, you connect it in series, and you get a high voltage, and you get the current from the, the cell that has lower current. And the important thing is that when you couple this to a catalyst, uh, remember that ICIQ is a chemical center. So we do a catalyst, we do organic molecules. The, uh, what we do is we use this uh, solar power uh, device to apply bias to this catalyst. And, and you look at where the catalytic curve crosses the curve, you get the voltage and the current you need actually to, to work. And when you do that, and if everything goes okay, you are able up, to- uh, Emilio? Yes, it's, it's finishing now. It's like two slides away. So uh, you see that uh, the oxygen in theory and in reality are matching and the hydrogen as well. And you could do this with chopping light and on and off. And, and basically you can split water into hydrogen and oxygen and you can use the hydrogen later for fuel cells. These sums can also be applied for uh, in organic light emitting diodes, which also are uh, very well known in the industry because they need less energy than, than the usual bulbs. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you again for this invitation. I'm sorry I could not uh, be more specific because uh, I didn't have much time and to look at all of you. Uh, I think the session is recorded, so I would appreciate if you send me the link so I can have access to all the presentations and whenever I'm doing uh, cycling at home or running in my treadmill, I will look at your presentation and I'm sure it will be when I have a lot of questions for you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think it's a great idea, this meeting, and I hope uh, we can have joint projects in the future.